It's simple. I have a story to tell and I write it in that voice. This was Gloria Naylor's response in a 1997 interview when asked about the various styles of her novels. Her reply made me rethink her story about Eugene Turner and wonder what she wanted to say through his voice. I believe her intent is for his story to be a cautionary tale, a warning for those who create environments wherein people cannot accept themselves. Gloria Naylor's Eugene, a chapter from her novel, The Men of Brewster Place, follows a young black man named Eugene who is married to a woman, Seal, but has homosexual desires. Eugene reflects on the early parts of their relationship and marriage, when they had dreams of leaving Brewster Place to build a better life together. Her uniqueness and strength captured his heart. As a teenager, Seal tells him that all she wants is to be special, and he tells her she already is. But Eugene gets noticed by Bruce, who he works with at the docks. Bruce invites Eugene out to the Bull and Roses, a gay bar where he meets Chino, a prostitute specializing in S&M who is effeminate, dramatic, and speaks of himself in the third person. Chino had begun a gender transition, but at some point stopped. Readers meet Chino from Eugene's point of view, and he uses he-him pronouns, but Chino uses she-her pronouns when speaking in third person, so Chino's preferred gender expression is clouded by this narrator. For the purposes of consistency with Eugene's narrative, this project will use he-him pronouns for Chino. After Eugene starts going out to the gay bar, he begins self-destructive behaviors such as vigorously scrubbing his entire body in the shower, as if he could remove his homosexual desire like this. He expresses deep love for Seal, but an inability to share his desires with her. Eugene had left her many times, but keeps returning. At first, it was because Seal was pregnant with their daughter, Serena, but even Eugene doesn't know why he returns so many more times. Meanwhile, Bruce takes Eugene under his wing as he enters the gay community, and Chino attempts to help him through his situation with Seal, advising him that breaking it off would be the kindest way to handle the dilemma. One day, Eugene comes home angry after having been laid off and picks a fight with Seal because she is expecting another baby and he doesn't think they can afford it, so she secretly ends the pregnancy. Their next fight comes as Eugene is packing up to leave Seal again. Serena is left unattended as they argue, and she electrocutes herself by putting a fork in an outlet. Eugene blames himself for Serena's death, and he is in so much pain that he does not attend her funeral. In search of redemption, Eugene goes to Chino and breaks down crying. He begins to ask Chino for what he needs, but Chino already knows. He brings out a leather whip with metal elements and begins whipping Eugene. Eugene does not allow Chino to stop, even when Chino can no longer stomach the violence. And that's where the chapter ends. Eugene's story demonstrates the power of perspective and identity. Naylor offers external and internal dialogues regarding the main character, Eugene. These dialogues are in conflict with each other, resulting in self-hatred and self-rejection. It is my goal to explore this dynamic. I assert that Eugene represents a down-low gay because he has internalized the external identity which others have assigned to him. Scholar Laylee Phillips defines the down low as, quote, black men who secretly have sex with other men while maintaining heterosexual relationships with women and presenting themselves as masculine rather than effeminate. This corresponds to what we see with Eugene. He begins self-policing as a result of his internalized homophobia and attempts to fulfill external expectations despite his internal identity being incompatible with them. I believe that what Naylor is saying with this story is that living as a down-low gay results in self-hatred and self-destruction, which prevents the establishment and expression of a secure identity. The way that Eugene leaves Seal but returns, then leaves again, shows an attempt to establish that identity, but an ultimate failure to do so. Because he cannot disentangle himself from internalized homophobia, his final request for excessive physical harm represents the complete relinquishment of his identity and body to external forces that wish to harm him. Naylor is demonstrating how down-low gays, if they do not accept themselves and resist internalizing homophobic rhetoric, can end up having no control over their own physical or mental being. The story opens with a short narrative from an external perspective, the super. We are never given the super's name. They are overly preoccupied with trash and who lets theirs spill into the street or who keeps a lid on it. They also sit on a trash can when they watch people come and go. The trash seems to represent gossip, the little scraps and pieces that people find and make assumptions about. 
They call the trash can they sit on their throne, as if they are the king of garbage, the king of gossip. We see this in action as they reveal to the reader that Eugene has left Seal about five times in six years, saying, it makes you wonder what it could all be about, before raising the possibility of cheating. Despite all the speculation, the super ends their introductory narrative by saying that trying to get the answer would be like peeking in through someone's bedroom window, and that Eugene can speak for himself if he wanted others to know his business. The contradiction in what the super says reveals that they don't like to take responsibility for the rumors they spread, instead saying that others should have listened to them about keeping their trash where it is with the lid on tight if they didn't want it blowing around the street. The super's narrative represents the external surveillance Eugene and other black LGBTQ plus people experience constantly and cannot escape. Throughout the rest of the story, now being provided from Eugene's point of view, there are interruptions, assumably from the super. It is the same one word each time, the F word. The repetition of this homophobic slur is significant because it emphasizes the relentlessness of hateful rhetoric on the LGBTQ plus community. Naylor is showing that words and social discourse may not appear to be violent, but it can cause serious damage when it's negative and consistently repeated, wearing the victim down. It is comparable to the concept of water torture, where a single drop of water representing the homophobic slur slowly drives the person crazy as it is repeated over and over with no end in sight. It is interesting that the super represents the surveillance of society because the super is technically an authority figure, but one without any real authority. They describe having to ask people repeatedly to keep their trash out of the street and in their trash bins, but no one listens. Laylee Phillips asserts in her discussion of the down low that, quote, the down low discourse feeds a neo-racist agenda by keeping black people in the position of spectacle or subordination to the entertainment arena. So one could look at the super figure not as just surveilling Eugene, but also enjoying his tragedy as if it were a form of entertainment. The super's interrupting slurs mark important moments, but the timing of the interruptions cease is also significant. The interrupting slur occurs four times, mostly punctuating milestones in the relationship between Eugene and Seal as he recounts it. However, the final slur occurs after the scene where Eugene and Bruce go to the Bull and Roses for the first time, and Eugene expresses concern about whether or not people at the docks might find out about him or Bruce, and Bruce does not share that concern and even explains that no one has ever asked him. The narrator's slurs stop interrupting when Eugene no longer requires external hatred because he has internalized it to such a degree that he begins policing and punishing himself. The next page after the interruption stops, Eugene is thinking about himself and he says, quote, that he's acting like a goddamned and there's an ellipsis. It's left unsaid, but it shows awareness of the external narrative repeating the F word and seems as though Eugene is expecting that word to fill in the blank here. When Eugene takes over as narrator, he is addressing his story to Seal. I think it's important to consider her as the audience here. He begs her to remember that he loved her and their daughter and that he was there for them when Serena came into the world. They had dreams together, plans for the future. So why does he write this letter to Seal? The emotion of the chapter and lack of resolution for Eugene suggests that he's still trying to explain himself to Seal because he still blames himself for his daughter's death. When considering identity, looking at Eugene, he's very concerned about external appearance. He's hypervigilant and hypersensitive. When Bruce wants to speak with him, he first thinks that he might be getting fired, but then he suddenly has a panic when he realizes that Bruce knows about his sexuality. He also, in his letter to Seal, is saying that he was afraid of what she might think of him and that she may not see him as a man anymore, and even worse, that she might hate him as much as he hated himself. That just sort of solidifies the self-hate that he has, um, the way that he's not accepted himself. He also cannot accept love from Seal because of that love that he lacks for himself, 
Um, he says that he blamed her for many things uh, and that he cringed listening to her beg because, quote, I wasn't good enough for you to wipe your shoes on. Experts Elon Meyer and Laura Dean examined the effects of internalized homophobia in their article, noting that, quote, gay men who internalize such beliefs may feel inferior to heterosexuals and unworthy or incapable of achieving goals that conflict with stereotypical prescriptions. For example, they may not attempt to develop satisfying intimate relationships or create alternative family units. This may explain why he felt that he was not good enough for SEAL. It also explains the conflict between Eugene and his family, because despite his deep love for Seal and Serena, he is not able to be a cohesive part of this family unit because of his sexuality and the fact that he hasn't accepted it. Looking at the external identity that Eugene assigns to the men around him is also important because it does seem as though he's projecting some of his own self-hatred onto the gay men in the story. So starting with Chino, who speaks in third person, um, which could be a way of distancing himself. It could be um, interpreted as him not being completely accepting of himself. Um, but Eugene has a very negative opinion of Chino, especially when he first sees him. Um, he's concerned that he may become like him, as if that's such a negative thing to be. Um, he also accuses Chino of sort of running away from himself by um, going through the procedures when he started his transition and that he um, only wanted to be feminine to sort of match the stereotypical um, male and female sexuality so that it didn't seem like he was so wrong. Um, but I feel this is a projection of Eugene's own feelings because Chino seems relatively secure um, in his sexuality, um, especially compared to Eugene. And um, it's possible Eugene is even jealous of Chino's ability to express his feminine side. Meanwhile, we also have Bruce, who um, is much more admired by Eugene. Um, he was feared at work um, not to be messed with. There were, um, you know, there was this reputation. He was hard on everyone and was very fierce, though he was fair. There was a big emphasis on the fact that he played basketball um, and the fact he was always aggressive and on the office on offense when he played um, because this is all um, pointing to a very masculine identity. And Eugene's positive perspective of Bruce, especially compared with his more negative view of Chino, shows that he values that more um, typical masculine presenting man. Naylor uses some important imagery to um, affect her purpose in this story. So one thing that keeps being repeated throughout the chapter is water imagery. Um, so Eugene does work at the docks. Um, he also, um, when he first starts going to the gay bar, he starts showering all the time and trying to use the water to scrub off the gay in a sense. Um, this also becomes a source of fighting between him and Seal um, because it leads to an increase in the, um, the bills because of the utilities that he's using. And so this becomes a fight as well. Um, in the lead up to Serena's death, um, just before um, him packing up, when they have a fight, there's a lot of water imagery there as she's making rice. There's water running from the faucet. Then later, Eugene describes that he's drowning in lies and describes himself as feeling underwater more than once. And finally, Chino calls him Sweetwater as a nickname. I think that this is especially important in considering identity because to me, I interpret this water imagery as sort of the depression and sadness that stems from not being able to accept himself within Eugene. And so for Chino to call him as a nickname, Sweet Water, it's saying that not only is Eugene surrounded by this negative depression and sadness um, and rejection, it's he's so surrounded by it that he's actually become it. Now he is the water. He is he has internalized this rejection. Another uh, piece of imagery that occurs, though not quite as frequently as the water, is the idea of locks. 
Eugene keeps talking about how Seal should change the locks to their house, how she should kick him out the door and change the locks behind him. Um, and I wonder, you know, is this because he feels that he should not be allowed access to the home because he hates himself? And this all comes back to the feeling that because he has homosexual desires, he is not allowed to have familial intimacy. Finally, I want to discuss the ending and how that relates to Eugene's um, internalized homophobia and self-destruction. Um, Eugene blames himself for his daughter's death, but it's unclear really if this is directly related to his self-hatred that stems from the homophobia. An objective perspective would obviously be that this is an unexpected tragedy which could have occurred in any family at any time. However, Eugene's perspective might be that had he not had homosexual desires, he would not have been fighting with Seal and that he would not have been distracted from watching Serena or um, that he failed to protect her as a father, which is an important identity for him. While failing to fulfill the role of a protective father may not be an obvious result of internalized homophobia, it could be related to insecurity over masculinity, which I would argue is a result of homophobic rhetoric. Her death also marks the loss of his last and only relatively stable identity, which was being a father. Without this, he becomes completely lost, and this is when he gives his body and mind completely over to external forces. He has failed to accept and assert his homosexual identity or any other, and his story reveals that even in hindsight, he has never accepted or forgiven himself. Naylor's Eugene is a tragic and moving story that emphasizes the impacts of homophobic language on the LGBTQ community. If you enjoyed this video, please read Gloria Naylor's novel, The Men of Brewster Place, and remember to speak kindly to others 